And it says that we will not be able to buy or sell. We don't even take it seriously. We don't even know what it means. We're just presumptuous. We think, okay, that's great. You know, we've been preaching the out of the city's message for 150 years, nothing's happened. Or we think that we can just stay where we are, not do anything different. But that's presumption. When God gave us a warning ahead, like Noah, he told Noah, you need to build an ark. And if Noah decided, that's okay, I think God's going to just make me a boat on the last day when it starts raining, then I, don't, I think the story would have ended a little bit differently. But he was told ahead that he needed to prepare for this event. She says, out of the cities, out of the cities. This is the message the Lord has been giving me. Most people don't know the history. And that's why we need to get back studying our Bibles. We need to get back studying our history. So it says here that nobody that does not have the mark of the beast will be able to buy or sell. Welcome to the first night of Build Your Ark camp meeting. And today, we have a very interesting topic. It is about the no buy, no sell, or this term that's used a lot, referred to as no buy, no sell. What does this mean, no buy, no sell? And what is it actually referring to? And does it have any relevance for us today? Is it something that we actually need to be considering, or is it something that will happen, that will take place, but not something that we really have to worry about? Now, when talking about this topic, there's two powers that are extremely important, and they're found in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. But before we open our Bible, let's just start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all together this evening, that we can open your word, that we can learn the truths that is found in your book, in your prophecy, the revealing of your word to us. We ask that you'd give us wisdom and lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. We're going to use our Bibles quite a bit this week. Slides are good, but Bibles better. Revelation 13, and let's start at verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So here we see this beast that's coming up out of the sea. It's a very strange-looking beast. Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So we have this first beast. It's a leopard-like beast, it says, coming up out of the sea. It has seven heads, and it has ten horns. Now, when we're talking in the book of Revelation, these are figures. These are not literal imagery we see here, because we know there's no beasts that actually have seven heads and ten horns. So we need to understand what it's trying to say to us and break it down. Now that's the first beast. Now there's a second beast in the same chapter. If we go down to verse 11, verse 11, Revelation 13 and verse 11, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, 
and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So this second beast, it says that he's going to cause the whole world to worship this first beast. Now let's jump down to verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So when we make an image of something, if we take a picture or we make a drawing, it's something that's supposed to look like the original. So this second beast is going to create something to mimic the first beast. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So here we have the first time mentioned this no buy, no sell term. And it is being given by this second beast. Now what's interesting is the first beast comes up out of the sea. This second beast comes up out of the earth. Now in Revelation and in the Bible, these figures are explained either in the same passage or in somewhere else in the Bible. So this is actually from Revelation 17. So we just turn a few chapters later, and we go to chapter 17. Revelation 17 and verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So what do the waters represent? Many people. So we have a beast that is coming from a very populated area and then one that is coming from a very unpopulated area. So we have these two beasts. One that's leopard-like, seven heads, ten horns. This is an artist's depiction of the two beasts. And the second beast is, has two horns and has the mouth of a dragon because it says it speaks like a dragon. So what do beasts represent in the Bible? Well, let's turn to Daniel 7. Daniel 7 and verse 23. Because we don't want to be guessing at anything. We want to have a solid foundation for everything that we're saying. Daniel 7 and verse 23. And he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom on the earth. So these beasts are representing different kingdoms. So that gives us a little bit of a clue of what's happening here. So we have this kingdom that's rising from a populated area and a kingdom that is rising from an unpopulated area. I'm going to read a quote from Great Controversy, page 439. In chapter 13 is described another beast, like unto a leopard, to which the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority, this symbol, as most Protestants have believed, represents the papacy, which succeeded to power and seat and authority once held by the ancient Roman Empire. So this is not something that is a guess, but if we go through all the criteria in Revelation 13, and unfortunately we don't have time to go through every single point, but we can see clearly that no other kingdom would match that description. So we have the first beast is represented by the papal power, and we're going to see that a little bit more clearly as we continue. Of the leopard-like beast it is declared, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell therein, in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. This prophecy, which is nearly identical to the description of the little horn in Daniel 7, unquestionably points to the papacy. So this is referring to the dark ages where the papal power was persecuting the Christians and it went to make war with the saints and those who tried to keep the commandments of God. 
because the papacy has their own set of commandments, and we're going to see this more clearly. But the beast with lamb-like horns was seen coming up out of the earth. Instead of overthrowing other powers to establish itself, the nation thus represented must arise in territory previously unoccupied and grow up gradually and peacefully. It could not then arise from the crowded and struggling nationalities of the old world, that turbulent sea of peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. It must be sought in the Western continent. So we see that this new beast or this new kingdom is going to come from an unpopulated area. What nation of the world was in 1798 rising to power, giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the intention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question one nation and only one meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. So this is an entire hour-long study in itself, just going through proving the points of this being the papal power and the United States of America. This is something that we have many videos on that you can take a look at uh, that go through this in detail. We don't have time for that this evening. But if we can just see these two beast powers or these two kingdoms representing the papacy and the United States of America, this is starting to give us a little bit of a picture of what's happening here. Revelation 13, 14, and 16. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now we need to ask the question, why is this actually going to happen? Why is this beast going and warring against the keepers of the commandments or God's people? Well, we can look in just the chapter before, in chapter 12. If we look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, it gives us the answer. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So they have two things. They keep the Ten Commandments, all ten, and they have the testimony of Jesus. And what is the testimony of Jesus? If we turn to Revelation 19, verse 10, it gives us the answer. Revelation 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for what does it say? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So these people have the commandments and keep the commandments of God, but they also obey the spirit of prophecy, which is a very important point. And that no man might buy or sell, verse 17, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it says here that nobody that does not have the mark of the beast will be able to buy or sell. Now, we definitely don't want the mark of the beast. Most people know or understand that the mark of the beast is a bad thing. So we need to understand what that mark is so that we do not receive the mark of the beast but receive the mark or the seal of God. But first we need to understand what God's seal is so that we can understand what the opposite is. So in order to do that, we need to go to the Old Testament. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. And we'll be looking at many texts today because we want to make sure that everything's based on the Word of God. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Now that word sign there 
In the original, in Hebrew, you can look it up. It's Hebrew number 226. It's the word oath, and it actually means mark. So it's the same word that's being used in Revelation about the beast power having its mark, but this is God's mark. And it says that his mark is the Sabbath. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 to 8. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 to 8. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign, that's the word mark again, it's the same Hebrew word, upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So we have this mark being put on the hand and on the forehead. And it is the law which God gave. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 9. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. And that word sign there again is the word mark. So we see here that God's mark or his sign, the sign that we are part of his people, is the Sabbath. Now, why is the Sabbath so important. So if we read the Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20, there's a couple things that we can note. One, when something is a seal, when a king used to use a seal, it would have to have three things. It would have to have their name, their title, and their territory. And the Sabbath commandment has all those things. He's the Lord God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. So he is the Lord, he is the creator, and his territory is all of creation, all of heaven and earth. Now, if the Sabbath is God's mark, then what is this mark of the beast when, if we know that this beast that's being represented is the papal system, that's not talking about individuals in the system, but the system itself and the leaders behind the system. What is their mark? Well, in no short words, they say it very clearly. Catholic record, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. So they give it right to us. We don't even have to guess. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So here they're saying that Sunday is their mark and that they are above the Bible. Now, I have a problem with that because the Bible is my authority. Let's continue. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they're following a law of the Catholic Church. So here again, they're saying, if you want to keep the Bible, then you should probably worship on Sabbath. Another quote, Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. So they're saying very clearly that even from the Bible, in their opinion, that it's better if you keep the seventh day as the Sabbath than the first day. Catholic Mirror, December 23, 1893. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives, either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. So we have these two ideologies, One, where the Bible is the foundation and where God says that his mark is in the Sabbath 
And then we have the other, which is the papal system, and their mark, which is the keeping holy of Sunday. Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, this isn't just digging up things that nobody's reading. This is the catechism of Catholic doctrine. This is one of the main things that people who are going to the Catholic Church read. And what's interesting is I have family members that are Catholic, and they said to us, the difference between me and you, you believe the Bible and the Bible only. I believe the Bible and tradition, and tradition overrides the Bible. So this is very clear that there is a, a difference in the ideology. Evangelism, page 234. The change of the Sabbath is a sign or mark of the authority of the Romish church. Those who understand the claims of the fourth commandment choose to observe the false Sabbath in the place of the true, are thereby paying homage to that power by which alone is commanded. The mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath, which has been accepted by the world in the place of the day of God's appointed. Letters and Manuscripts, 1899. Sunday keeping is not yet the mark of the beast, and will not be until the decree goes forth, causing men to worship this idle Sabbath. The time will come when this day will be the test, but that time has not yet come. We have quite a few quotes that are going to be reading this evening, so hopefully it doesn't get to be too many, but I don't want to be saying everything. I want everything to be backed up by either the Word of God or the Spirit of Prophecy. Evangelism, page 235. If the light of truth has been presented to you, revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing that there is no foundation in the word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep holy the Sabbath which God calls my holy day, you receive the mark of the beast. When does this take place? When you obey the decree that commands you to cease from labor on Sunday and worship God. Well, you know that there is not a word in the Bible showing Sunday to be either a common working day. You consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. So this doesn't happen until this image of the beast or America or the other countries that will follow because it says it will go to the whole world and make the whole world worship the first beast. That is, and only then, is when the mark of the beast will actually be given and you'll have a choice between the mark of the beast or the seal of God. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance to the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. Well, one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to define authority, receive the seal of God. Review and Herald. There can be only two classes. Each party is distinctly stamped, either with the seal of the living God or with the mark of the beast and his image. In the end, when these things start happening, there will be only two classes of people because everybody will be given the opportunity to see what is God's mark and do I want to follow it or will I follow the system because they are pressuring me? Because it says that they will not be able to buy or sell. So that 
means that we may not be able to buy food, water, power. It could be endless. Country Living, page 29. God has sent warning after warning that our schools and publishing houses and sanitariums are to be established out of the city. This is why Amazing Discoveries moved out of the city. We used to be located in Vancouver, but we felt the need that we need to be out because of the things that we see are going to happen soon in this world. Let no one attempt to use the testimonies to vindicate the establishment of large business interests in the cities. Do not make of no effect the light that has been given upon this subject. Men will arise speaking perverse things to counterwork the very movement that the Lord is leading his servants to make. But it is time that men and women reason from cause to effect. It is too late, too late to establish large business firms in the cities, too late to call young men and women from the country to the city. Conditions are arising in the cities that will make it very hard for those of our faith to remain in them. It would therefore be a great mistake to invest money in the establishment of business interests in the cities. So it is very clear here that especially people who are going to be keeping the commandments of God and who are trying to have character like Jesus in the city where there is so many distractions, there's so many things that the devil is using, and especially the time that is coming when they will be forcing people who don't take the mark of the beast that they will not be able to buy and sell. As far as possible, our institutions should be located away from the cities. I'm going to just skip down to save for time. That means that families of our people must settle near them. So if our institutions are located near the cities, that means our workers have to be located near the cities. And we felt responsible for our workers who had to live near the city as well. The Lord desires his people to move into the country where they can settle on the land and raise their own fruit and vegetables and where their children can be brought in direct contact with the works of God in nature. Take your families away from the cities is my message. Maranatha, page 179. A time is coming, and there's a lot of quotes here, but I want to read a lot to make it very clear that this isn't something that is just maybe referenced in a few obscure passages, but is a constant theme. A time is coming when the law of God is in a special sense to be made void in our land. The rulers of our nation will, by legislative enactments, enforce the Sunday law. And thus God's people will be brought into great peril when our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to bind the conscience of men in regard to their religious privileges. Enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh-day Sabbath. The law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land. This seems quite hard to even believe sometimes when saying that we will be forced to worship on Sunday when it seems that most of the country and the countries are atheist. But this is how we can see that the Bible is true, because when these things start to come to pass, then we see how it predicted it ahead of time. The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy. Skipping down, the churches would themselves form an image to the beast. So this is saying that the churches are actually going to ask for this to be enforced. This will be something the people are wanting because they're saying, God is so far from our country, everything's getting so bad, we need God back. But they're going to ask for different law than God's law and thinking that they are honoring God in that. So we have this image that is being built up. And I want to go, there's 
some really nice typology in the Old Testament. And let's go to Daniel. Is there any other time in the Bible that something like this has happened, where an image was created that we needed to worship? Well, if you go to Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So who set up an image here? Nebuchadnezzar did. And what's interesting is this image, it says was the height of three score cubits. What is three score? Well, that is two times three, so it's 60 cubits by six by six. It was 666 in its measurements, which is exactly what we find in Revelation 13 is the number of the beast. Now let's jump down to verses three to six. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. So here he's talking to the sea of people. That at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Does this not sound extremely similar to Revelation 13? We had an image being put up, and then those who didn't worship the image would be killed. Now let's jump down to verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter, which just means that they weren't beating around the bush. It was easy for them to give an answer. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Well, that is a very interesting statement because they said that he would. How are they so certain? But if not, so they're saying even if he didn't, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And we know the rest of the story. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, but they didn't die. Now, this is a very interesting concept, which I wish we had more time to get into. But when we're talking about the image of the beast here, and the not being able to buy or sell, and then it said that those who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, but at that time, Nobody will be killed of God's people, and we're going to prove that. Now let's go to Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verse 6 to 8. Matthew 14, verse 6 to 8. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would. And she, being before instructed of the mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. We have a king. And then we have a daughter that is prompted by the mother. Now what's interesting is the papacy calls himself the mother church. So we have this mother prompting the daughters, which is the image of the beast, which is the Protestant churches that are keeping the papal Sabbath. 
and they're going to ask all the world to worship this first beast, and that if you don't worship it, that you should be killed like she wanted John the Baptist's head on the platter. So we have examples of this being throughout the Bible. Testimonies, Volume 7, page 141. The substitution of the laws of men for the laws of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath, is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. He will arise in his majesty to shape terribly the earth he will come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity, and the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So here we see that the very last things that are going to happen right before Jesus stands up and says it is finished is this Sunday enforcement where people will be forced to either worship on Sunday or they will not be able to buy or sell, and eventually that they shall be put on a death decree. Now, some people are saying that we're in the time of trouble now, and that would not be accurate, because then either people have the mark of the beast or the seal of God right now, because that is when the test will be happening. So we're not in the time of trouble now, but we have had hints that it's coming soon. Now, also, I just want to point out that this is not going to have to do with climate Sundays. This is a step in the process, but no one's going to receive the mark of the beast because they're keeping a climate Sunday, and they didn't know better. This is something when it comes to worship. Either you worship God on the papacy's day, or you worship God on God's day, and you receive God's mark or the beast mark. Now, when we're reading, there's a book called Country Living, written by Ellen White, and it's a fascinating book and it has some really nice things, but something you have to note is that it's not written in chronological order. And when you take all the quotes in the book and put them in chronological order, you start to see a sequence. And we're going to take a look at that, because she has a change of urgency. Now, this is actually on the last page of the book. And it says that the time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. So if you don't know the story, you can read the whole account in Great Controversy, but it's a historical event. It happened in AD 70 where Rome came to Jerusalem and they sieged the city. They sieged the city and then after a time they left and that gave God's people an opportunity to run away from the city. They fleed the city. They went into the mountains, into the country. And then the Rome came back and resieged, and all the rest of the people perished. So she's giving a type here of the siege of Jerusalem, and she's saying the time is not far distant. So now the question is, have we seen this siege yet? Because most preachers and pastors will say that oh, once you see Sunday law coming, then you should start thinking about going to the country. Now, this is interesting because she has a, t a change of urgency here. Country Living, page 31. This is the page before. This was in 1906. The previous one was in 1885. Then we have 1906. She says, out of the cities, out of the cities, exclamation mark. This is the message the Lord has been giving me. Well, that's a very different change in urgency. Went from the time is not far distant to the time is now. Then she has in 1903, she said the time has come. So something between 1885 and 1903 shift the urgency. Then in 1897, she says this, 
For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places where they may cultivate the land and raise their own produce. Great Controversy, page 26. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans would be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, the followers of Christ were to have safety in flight. Now, I want to just do a little brief overview of what happened in AD 70 so we can maybe see the shift that has happened from 1885 and why she changed her urgency. The time is not far distant. We read this quote, when like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. Christ Triumphant, page 353. Christ warned his disciples of the destruction of Jerusalem as well as of the temple. This event was foretold by Daniel. The oblations and sacrifices were no more of value, for type had reached antitype in the one great oblation. When Christ referred to the destruction of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reached beyond that event to the final conflagration that will take place in that day when the Lord rises out of his place to punish the world for their iniquity when the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This entire chapter is a warning to those who shall live in the last scenes of earth's history. Christ had given his disciples warning, and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign, which was what? The first siege coming in. When the first siege came, they knew as soon as that siege left that they needed to leave Jerusalem. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. After the Romans, under Cestius, had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege. There was no real apparent reason for this. There are certain things that happened in history that people conclude, but that was an opening that God gave the people so that they could see the warning, it opened up, and that they could be rescued from that situation. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of His own people. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was afforded for all who would obey the Savior's warning. Terrible were the calamities that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege was resumed by Titus. In the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. Now we should ask, did this first siege already happen? Most people don't know the history. And that's why we need to get back studying our Bibles. We need to get back studying our history, the Three Angels' Message history, because we were talking about this uh, over 150 years ago. Now, the thing is, we had those two dates, 1885 and 1897. Something happened between there. And actually, something did. On May 25th, 1888... It is called the Blair's Bill. And actually, this is something that the Seventh-day Adventist Church fought against. It was a bill that came in, and it forced everybody to worship on Sunday. And that if you didn't worship on Sunday, many people were thrown in prison. This is a real historical event. You can look it up. We had the first siege already. And if you don't believe me, I have a picture of the actual bill. The National Sunday Rest Bill. Senate Bill No. 2983, introduced in the first session of the Fifth Congress by Senator H.W. Blair, May 21, 1888. Most preachers don't even know that this event happened, and they're still waiting for the first siege. We've been in such a time of mercy since 1888. We had the the out-of-the-cities message since then. 
The first siege had already happened, and it went away. And only because of God's mercy are we still not in the second siege yet. The Lonely Years, Volume 3, page 395. The Routine Business. Now, this is, this is to show that Adventism is even marking this as a date. General Conference, this is the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference, while vitally important, presented only a few features of unusual interest. Steps were taken to place in operation a missionary ship to serve the work for the church in the South Pacific. There was also consideration of measures to counter the Blair Sunday Bill before the United States Congress. So this was a thing that the whole world church was talking about, that we are going against this national Blair Sunday Rest Bill. And we don't even know that it happened. A.T. Jones actually went to Congress, and you can read his whole account. It's about 200 and some odd pages of the whole account, the dialogue between the Senate and him, and all the reasons he gave why this is unconstitutional. It's a very interesting read, and you should go take a look at it. You can, if you just look on Google and look up A.T. Jones, um, I had on the slide here, National Sunday Law Argument of A.T. Jones. If you look that up, you'll be able to read that. No one has yet received the mark of the beast. The testing time has not yet come. There are true Christians in every church, not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have the light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth, enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel, this is going to be a very key point that we're going to talk about again on Sabbath, is the purpose of the loud cry message. And the loud cry of the third angel so warn men against the worship of the beast and his image. The line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. So not until this is enforced, people get an opportunity to see and decide, do I want to follow what God is saying in the Bible or do I want to follow what they are trying to enforce? Great Controversy, page 594. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to carry away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation, and the time of trouble will find them unready. So when we read in Revelation 13, and we see that it says that there will be a mark put on those who keep the image of the beast, and there will be a sign of God's people as well. That's talked about in Revelation 7 and 14 of the 144,000. And it says that we will not be able to buy or sell we don't even take it seriously. We don't even know what it means. We're just presumptuous. We think, okay, that's great. You know, we've been preaching the out of the city's message for 150 years. Nothing's happened. Or we think that we can just stay where we are and not do anything different. But that's presumption. When God gave us a warning ahead, like Noah, he told Noah, you need to build an ark. And if Noah decided that's okay, I think God's going to just make me a boat on the last day when it starts raining. Then I don't, I think the story would have ended a little bit differently. But he was told ahead that he needed to prepare for this event. A storm approaches. A large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. It's easy to confess things when times are easy, but when things get hard, then sometimes it's a little bit... we're inclined to give up the truths that we know. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, 
they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. That is very sad. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. I didn't even want to highlight anything here because it's such a sad slide and sad truth. For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places. Now, who knows who Joe Cruz is? He was the previous and the, the starter of Amazing Facts. He was in 1960s to 1990s. And this is a book of his called Reaping the Whirlwind. And already in his time, he was saying what he's saying here. Page 66. The large cities will be centers of violence and dangers. There will be no safe place for Sabbath keepers. We have received warning after warning to leave the great metropolitan areas and secure small places in the country. So even he was talking in his time that we need to be heeding this council getting out of the cities because it will be virtually inhabitable. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. Now, that's a very interesting topic in itself, is the labor unions, because most people wonder, well, that's a funny statement. How are the labor unions going to aid in the Sunday law? We just recorded a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago an uh, entire podcast, an hour long, about the labor unions, what they're doing right now to enforce Sunday worship on Truth Matters podcast on labor unions. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again, get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together, and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. So we've had this message for a long time, and that we need to start preparing, raising our own food, because when we can't buy or sell and we can't buy food, if we're starving, the pressure is going to be very great for us to take the mark of the beast. And we want to be ready that we are not being pressured in those ways. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 356. Get out of the cities as soon as possible and purchase a little piece of land where you can have a garden, where your children can watch the flowers growing and learn from them lessons of simplicity and purity. When we look at the present situation, things that have happened over the past couple of years, I think things happened that nobody would have expected could happen. We see food shortages just around the corner. And people, three years ago, were scoffing. Why are you going to the country? People who are already getting country places. It was almost like they're trying, just saying, oh, you're just trying to save yourself. And now the world, if you look, is moving into the country faster than all the Adventists are. We're the ones who have the message. We're the ones who know the prophecies in the Bible. And the world is seeing the things that are happening better than we are. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refusing to accept the spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God, Jehovah. So we need to understand the timeline that's happening here. 
and we're going to go through the whole sequence of events on Sabbath from 1888 all the way down to the second coming because there's a lot of things that are still going to take place that we don't realize. So here it says that the image of the beast, which is Sunday observance, is going to happen before probation closes. So this isn't right at the end when we'll be fleeing into the wilderness and God's going to be sustaining us. This is a time that's starting sooner. Medical Ministry, page 310. To parents who are living in the cities, the Lord is sending the warning cry. Gather your children into your own houses. Gather them away from those who are disregarding the commandments of God, who are teaching and practicing evil. Get out of the cities as fast as possible. And realize it says as possible because it's in God's time. We're not supposed to now hurry and rush and make rash decisions, but we need to still do everything in prayer. If we're doing everything still on our own steam, then we're defeating the purpose. The purpose of getting into the country is so we can be closer to God, so that we can rely on Him more and exercise our faith, not that we can have more faith in ourselves. Parents can secure small homes in the country with land for cultivation where they can have orchards and where they can raise vegetables and small fruits to take the place of flesh meats, which is so corrupting to the lifeblood coursing through the veins on such places the children will not be surrounded with the corrupting influence of the city life. God will help his people to find such homes outside the city. So there's even a health message connected here. And there's a promise there. And when God asks us to do something, He doesn't ask us to do something without giving us the way to do that thing. So when He says, I need you to get into the country, Noah, I need you to build an ark, but I'm not going to give you any help in designing the ark. I'm not going to give you any help in building the ark. I'm not going to give you enough time to build the ark. He gave Noah 120 years to build the ark. He gave us plenty of time right now by His mercy to get ready. And it says that he will help his people. So even if it seems impossible, even if it doesn't seem like you have enough money, he's going to have a way. And even if he has to just give you a piece, he will do so. If we act in faith. Signs of the Times, 1910. Then will Protestant America have formed an image to the papacy. And there will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. So a lot of people, I've heard a lot of preachers say that there's going to be a total collapse of everything, the economy, before Sunday happens. But that's actually not biblical. And that's not according to the spirit of prophecy because the national apostasy, the full universal effect of this Sunday law will then end in national ruin. And when you study this term, national ruin, we need to study the spirit of prophecy the same way we study our Bible. We need to take the words and we need to cross-reference them because it's the same spirit that gave both. And when we look at the word ruin, it's always used in context of financial ruin. So when the Sunday law comes, we'll also be seeing on Sabbath that the four winds that's talked about in Revelation, we can quickly turn there. Revelation 7. Revelation chapter 7, starting at verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. And the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, or any tree, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So, not until after God's people are sealed, and until everybody's had an opportunity to hear the gospel message, then a total collapse of everything. The four winds will be released and God's judgments will be poured on the earth. But God needs that message to reach every single ear 
so that everyone has an opportunity first. Now we're going to close on this slide, and we're going to be breaking this down on Sabbath. So this is a little timeline of the events. NSL stands for National Sunday Law, COP is Close of Probation, and SC is the Second Coming. So we have the Out of the Cities message starting in 1888, because that is when the first siege happened. And then we have a build-up, and this is in Ellen White's writings. It will start with fines, imprisonment, bribery, and eventually go to no buy, no sell. And that will be the closer probation time for the people who understand the Sabbath message, because they're the ones who know. Let's look at a couple of these Bible verses here just before we close. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall then the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So it says that judgment begins at the house of God because they're the ones giving the message. They're the ones who should understand what's happening. Let's go to Ezekiel quickly. Ezekiel 9, verse 4 to 6. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4 to 6. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So it says here that judgment is starting at the house of God. The people who know and understand the message because they are going to be giving, when that Sunday law comes, the latter rain will be poured out and we'll be going through each of these little details to show exactly when these events are going to happen. The mark of the beast is going to be start to be given and the loud cry message will be given to the world, which is just a repeat of the three angels' message. Now, I don't think we fully understand the three angels' message. Let's go to Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14, a lot of people say, yes, we preach the three angels' messages. But do they understand what is all happening in the three angels' messages? Let's look at verse 9, the third angel's message. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, so here's the loud voice again, if any man worship the beast, that sounds a lot like Revelation 13, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So what is the third angel's message? To not receive the mark of the beast. So the three angel's message is actually that of the country living message of Sunday versus Sabbath. So that these people do not receive the mark of the beast, that is the loud cry message at the end. They're going to be giving two options. And we need to be explaining that if you take this option, it's not going to end so good and that you want to take God's mark because He will protect you from the wrath that is coming on those who destroy His law and go against His commandments. Then once the close of probation happens, going back to our slide, that is when this time, what is called the great time of trouble or Jacob's trouble starts. At that time, we're going to be leaving our country places. There's no need of them anymore. There's no need to grow our own food. We're going to be fleeing into the wilderness, and God's angels will be taking care of us. And this will be just a very short time. This is also the time when the death decree will be given, when it says those who don't take the image should be killed. We'll be fleeing, and this is also the time when God will be pouring out the seven last plagues on the wicked 
who are trying to destroy God's people. So it is actually a thing of mercy that's happening. And we're slowly but surely getting to a point where we trust more and more fully in God. We're in the city where we fully trust man to deliver food to the grocery store. Then we move to the country. And there's a little bit more faith involved. Yes, we're planting our garden, we're watering, we're doing these things, which is what the whole camp meeting is about. But we have to trust that that's going to grow and that God's going to be able to sustain us through the things that we are growing. But then he takes it to the next level. And then we're fleeing in the wilderness where we have no garden, we have no security of any sort into a place we've never seen, and we have to trust that he's going to keep us safe while there's people that are trying to kill us. But we will be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that says our God will save us through this time. And we need not fear this. So we're going to be talking throughout the course of this camp meeting all the principles and things that you can do yourself to help prepare or build your ark, as we called it, for this time of no buy, no sell. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us everything in advance. We thank you that you gave us your word, your revelation, your revealing to your people that we have not to guess and that we are not to be caught unaware when these events are going to happen, but that you told us ahead of time, like you told Noah a flood was coming and he was able to save his whole family, that you told us that a time is coming where we cannot buy or sell as long as we are trying to honor you and keep your commandments. But we know that you will help us through this time. And we ask that you'd bless everybody that is here, that is listening online, and that you would lead us into your whole and full truth, that we can understand the events that are soon to take place in our world, and that we will be ready to help preach and give that loud cry message. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This presentation was filmed at our 2022 camp meeting on site in British Columbia. If you would like to join for the next camp meeting, visit our events page for details, events.amazingdiscoveries.org.